Hi everyone, this video is going to be on wheeled robot motion models. So wheeled robots are kind of self-explanatory. It's any robot that has wheels. So car-like robots are probably the most familiar if you are not very experienced with robotics. There are lots of other types of wheeled robots. I list a few of them here, but even outside of the slide, there are quite a few others. The robots that we're going to be focused on in this class are differential drive robots. Differential drive robots have two wheels that are controlled independently by their own motor. So a good example is the Kabuki mobile base. This is the base for the TurtleBot 2 platform. If you flip this robot over, there are two wheels. There's one on the left and one on the right. And each one of these wheels is controlled by its own separate motor. So we don't have one motor controlling both. Instead, we have two motors, each controlling their own wheel. The input to these kinds of robots are two velocity values one for the left wheel and one for the right wheel. Because again, each wheel is controlled independently. So you give a velocity for each wheel to generate the motion. And the overall motion of the robot depends on the relative velocities of the two wheels. So if both wheels are moving at the same velocity, then the whole robot would move on a straight line. If the two wheels are moving at opposite velocity, so same speed but different direction, then the robot would turn in place. And if it's anything else, then the robot is going to be be moving on some type of curve. We don't necessarily know what type of curve it will be moving on, but it will be moving on some kind of curve. The information we typically get about these robots' motions comes from wheel encoders. So wheel encoders are something that track how far a wheel turns. So here we have an example wheel with a bunch of tick marks on it, and we have an outer tick mark here. A wheel encoder will track, for instance, how many tick marks pass by the outer one within a given amount of time. And given that information and the wheel radius, we can actually detect how far the wheel has moved and how fast the wheel is moving. So our known information about the robot is the, the right wheel encoder ticks and the left wheel encoder ticks. And what we want to do is compute the odometry, which is the position and the orientation of the robot. So first, we'll define a few variables. We have C, which is the wheel circumference. In other words, the distance traveled in one full revolution. We have Q, which is the number of encoder ticks per revolution. And we have SIT. That's going to be the encoder tick for wheel I at time T. So the distance that the left wheel travels, DL, is going to be equal to the current encoder tick minus the last one that we saw, so the last time we checked for the ticks divided by the total number of encoder ticks per revolution multiplied by the wheel circumference. This will give us the total distance traveled by the left wheel. For the right wheel, it's going to be essentially the same equation, but instead of the left wheel encoder tick, we're checking the right wheel encoder ticks. So now what we're looking for is a motion model for the robot. You can also call it a transition model. It's the more general term. But the transition or the motion model for the robot is a set of equations to describe how the robot's overall state is going to change as it moves based on some sensing information. So the robot state x is going to be represented with an xy location and an orientation theta. And x prime is the new state, so the, the updated state for the robot. That's going to be some function of its current state or, or just most recent state and the distances that each wheel has driven. So given its current state and given the distances for each wheel, we should be able to compute how the robot's overall state has changed. So let's consider our mobile robot in a plane. It's represented by the circle here. The two wheels are these two rectangles. And it's got some reference point here in the center of the two wheels, and that's its xy position. So we'll let the variable rw denote the distance between the wheel and the center. Keep in mind this will be the same for both wheels. We're going to introduce a few more variables as well. So imagine that the robot has moved on some circular arc here, so from this position up to this position. rw is constant. r is going to be the radius of this curved path. So imagine that we have some circle formed by the left wheels as it moves along the circular arc, r is going to be the radius of that circular arc. Delta theta is going to be the change in orientation from the first point to the second point. And so then we can put in our distance values here. So we have dl, 
dr, and then d, which is the overall distance traveled by the robot. So dl is going to be this inner circular arc, dr is the outer one, and then d is the middle one. We can represent our distance equations in a different way, so not thinking about wheel encoder information, but instead just thinking about geometry. Right, so dl is going to be r times delta theta, this is the circular arc equation. Um, r is going to be uh, the, the radius here, and then dl, of course, is this inner arc. If we look at d, it's the same equation, but we're using a different value for the radius. So we have r plus rw, because remember, we have to get to the, the reference point of the robot. And then dr is going to be essentially the same thing again, but r plus 2 rw, so that it goes from r to the reference point, and then adding another rw in order to get over here to the, the right wheel. But usually we don't know delta theta, so we can't just automatically plug it into those equations. Normally what we're trying to do is compute delta theta and d. The only information we have are the distances from, from each wheel, right? We know this from our wheel encoder equations. And rw, you know, the distance between the, the wheels and the robot's reference point, we know this just from the robot model. So, using these, we need to try to compute d and delta theta. So we're going to start by solving for delta theta. So if we put back down our equations for dl and dr based on the geometry that we see here, we have you know, dl is equal to this arc equation for the inner arc, dr is the arc equation for the outer arc. If we rearrange this and do you know, a little bit of algebra, what we end up with is delta theta equals dr minus dl divided by 2rw. This is nice because we know all of the values in, in, on the right-hand side, right? We know dr, we know dl, we know rw, so then we can compute delta theta just from these variables. So now we'll solve for d. I put these four equations at the top here for reference. The first thing that we're going to do is take equation 3, and we're going to distribute out this delta theta. So for the first step, we get d equals r delta theta plus rw times delta theta. That's just, again, distributing, distributing out this delta theta in equation 3. Then, if we look at this equation here, we know that the first term, r delta theta, is equal to dl. So we'd put dl here. And for the second term, this is kind of a play on equation 4. So if we multiply both sides by rw, then on the left-hand side, we would get rw times delta theta which is what we have here. So then the right-hand side, what we have left, is dr minus dl over 2. So then we just do some fraction work, and we end up with d equals dl plus dr divided by 2. So given only the distance that each wheel has traveled with these equations here, we can actually calculate the total distance traveled by the robot, this d value, and the change in orientation. And we have these two equations down here that we just derived, and both of them only contain uh, the distance that each wheel has traveled and the rw term, which is always a, a known constant term. So now we can calculate the change in the robot's position, so the change in the x direction and the change in the y direction. Since we know what d is and since we know delta theta, which will give us the robot's you know, latest orientation theta, we can plug those in to just basic trig functions and say, Delta x is equal to d times cosine theta, and the change in y is equal to d times sine of theta. So now we can incorporate everything we've gone over into a motion model for a differential drive robot. So we're trying to compute x prime, so the, the updated state for the robot. So we need an updated value for each component, the xy position and the orientation theta. This is going to be some function of the robot's previous state x and the distance that each wheel has traveled, so dl, dr. And if we start putting the math in, we're going to see um, our previous state x is going to be just x, y, theta. We're adding to each of these. And over here, we're essentially adding delta x, delta y, and delta theta. The top two are just based on the trig functions we went over last slide, so d times cosine of theta. The difference here is that we've got theta plus delta theta. So we're incorporating the change in orientation that happens as the robot moves from x to x prime. So we are essentially saying x plus delta x, but that expands to x plus d times cosine of theta plus delta theta. Uh, 
y is going to be pretty much the same thing, but we're using sine instead of cosine. And then theta only changes based on delta theta. We can expand this vector even more by expanding the terms d and delta theta. So over here, I have written out the, the equations for d. So rather than just saying d, I've got dl plus dr divided by 2. And then for delta theta, I've also put in the formula for delta theta that's based on our wheel encoder information. And then, of course, at the bottom, we just have delta theta here. Uh, now, you will have to expand this further whenever you actually code this from, from scratch. You know, you'll have to expand dl and dr to see the, the full math. I did not put them here simply because I did not have enough room. But you can just refer to earlier parts of this video uh, where we go over uh, how to compute dl and dr. So now let's think about how to compute the velocity of the robot as it moves. So imagine that some robot is moving from one position to another position. There's some linear velocity that connects these two positions. And the robot is also going to have some angular velocity, theta dot. How do we compute v and x dot and y dot and theta dot just from the information that, that we have so far? So x dot and y dot are fairly straightforward. right? We just use basic trig for these x dot is going to be v times the cosine of the orientation. y dot is going to be v times the, the sine of the orientation. A problem, though, is that we don't know v yet, right? This is the linear velocity of the, of the whole robot, but we don't know that value yet. Instead, all that we know are the velocities of the wheels, right? We, we didn't talk about these variables vl and vr yet, but you just take the distance of, that the wheel has traveled divide it by the elapsed time, and that gives you the velocity. So we can very easily find the left and right wheel velocities. And to find the overall velocity of the robot, we say v is equal to vl plus vr divided by 2. And then to compute theta dot, we would take vr minus vl and divide those by 2 times rw. You may recall rw is the distance from the reference point of the robot to the wheel of the robot. So this leads us to a control system where we're able to compute these velocities, x dot, y dot, theta dot, based on the inputs that we give to the robot. Recall that the only inputs for differential drive are the left wheel velocity and the right wheel velocity. But given these two, and given rw, of course, which is a, a constant value, we can compute what the, the robot's velocity is at any point for all x dot, y dot, and theta dot. So let's look at how we would model a car-like robot to define a control system for it. Typically, the reference point for car-like robots is in the middle of the back two wheels. So here we have this point that represents the x and the y of the overall robot. We also have this you know, front axle up here. And the distance between the back axle and the front axle we refer to as L. Theta is going to be the overall angle of the robot, and it's going to be based on the back axle here. This variable phi up here is going to be the steering angle. So that's the direction of the wheels relative to the robot's orientation. So you can see here we have some orientation theta. And phi is the difference between this orientation of the overall robot and the direction that the front wheels are pointing. The control system for the car-like robot looks like this here. The inputs that we have are v1 and v2. These are two different velocities. V1 is the wheel velocity. So imagine that you're pressing the accelerator to increase the, the speed of the wheels. That's V1. V2 is the steering velocity. That's going to be how we're changing the, the direction of the front wheels of the car. So as you can see, the V dot is only going to be equal to V2. But the other three, x dot, y dot, theta dot, you know, are some combination of trig functions based on theta and phi. And theta as well includes L, the distance between the two sets of wheels. Now we need to define two variables. One is degrees of freedom. This is the number of parameters defining a system that can be moved freely without moving another parameter of the system. Then we have configuration, which is the number of independent parameters that define a system's pose. Oftentimes, these will be the same set of variables, but not always. But first, let's try to think of what this would be for a simple point in a planar coordinate system. How would you define its configuration? How many degrees of freedom does it have? Try to take a moment to think about this. Pause the video and come back when you have an idea.
So if we wanted to find a points configuration, I think we just need x, y, and it's going to have two degrees of freedom because we can move the point along x, and that will not affect its y value, and we can move it along y, and that will not affect its x value. So we can extend this to a spatial system. We would have z, and that would have three degrees of freedom as well. How about a laptop moving on the surface of a table? Pause this video again, think about this, and unpause when you're ready to see the answer. So what I would have for a laptop moving on the surface of a table, for its configuration, I would define it as x and y, right, for the kind of planar system moving on the, the flat surface of the table, and then also theta for how much the screen is open, right, because laptops you can open and shut the screen, so we would have theta to represent how far the screen is open. And we can have uh, all three of these as a degree of freedom because we can, you, we can move any of these parameters and they will not affect the, the other one. So how does this apply to mobile robotics? Well, first let's look at the car-like robot and ask how would we define its configuration? I would define its configuration as x, y, theta. This would describe the, the pose of the robot, pretty much everything we need to know how the robot is oriented in the world and where it's located at in the world. We would just say x, y, and then theta, its overall orientation. How many controllable degrees of freedom does it have, though? Well, for that, it only has two. Right? The only things that we control whenever we are controlling a car are the acceleration and the steering angle. So, we say that car-like robots are non-holonomic. Non-holonomic means that the number of controllable degrees of freedom is less than the number of degrees of freedom in the configuration. The reason we care about this is that it tends to manifest itself as putting constraints on how the body can move. So, for instance, for a car, it's impossible to move sideways. Right? If, if you want to move the car forward or backwards, you can do that. But if we wanted to move it to the right or to the left, we, we physically can't do it. Right? We would have to move the car all the way up, turn the steering angle, and then reverse into this other spot. So we're not able to move in the x direction without changing both the y, right? you have to go vertically here, and theta, the, the orientation of the car. Differential drive robots are also non-holonomic systems. Similar to car-like robots, they cannot instantaneously move sideways. We would represent their motion constraint with this equation up here. And really what this equation is saying is that the robot can only move in the direction of its orientation. Car-like robots are also subject to the same constraint here. The reference point back here can only move in the direction of the robot's orientation which is the direction of the back wheel. So every time the car moves, this reference point here is only ever moving in the direction of the back wheels. They're also subject to another motion constraint, though, and that has to do with the point in the middle of the front wheel, so in other words, the front of the car. It's essentially the same equation as the, the first one, but the angle inside is different, and all this is saying is that this point here in, in the middle of the front wheels can only move in the direction of the front wheels, right? Because we're saying theta plus phi up here, so plus the steering angle. So this point only moves in the direction of the front wheels. So to recap what we went over in this video, we derived a motion model for differential drive robots with wheel encoder data. This is really nice because we can then use this motion model to accurately drive a robot. Afterwards, we introduced non-holonomic systems and talked about the constraints that has on a robot's motion. In class this week, we're going to be putting all of this math into practice. Our application assignment is going to be coding a ROS node to implement a wheel encoder-based motion model. So we're going to implement all the math that we did in this lecture, and you'll be able to compute how far a differential drive robot has driven based only on wheel encoder data.